So we're just really excited to be here. Um, I know many of you have been here for a few years. Some of you are new. Um, but for us, it's really amazing to be here leading organizations that have been doing this work for, in the case of my organization, more than 30 years and Willie more than a decade, uh, to talk just for a few minutes about what it really takes to make impact investing work. Um, and specifically, we just wanted to talk about three things, what we do, what it takes for it to work, and then most importantly, what are we learning from the doing of it? Uh, many of us for many years have been talking a lot, uh, writing, listening, um, but it's a rare opportunity to learn from a doer like Willie, and I'll talk about what my team does as well. Um, my sense is that at, at SOCAP, there's always three kinds of people in impact investing. There's haters who really believe that what we're doing either is crazy or destructive. Uh, there are hypers who say that everything about impact investing is amazing, is going to work really simply. Um, and then they're doers. And I really think of Willie as an amazing example of, of a doer from whom we can learn. And I know you guys have been sitting for a while, so I just want everyone to stand up. And it's really quickly. Uh, if you characterize yourself as a <coughs> doer, stay standing. Uh, if you're a hyper or a hater or hopefully something else, uh, have a seat. We just <laughs> want to get a sense of um, who we are. I know none of the haters are going to, you know, coming here and being a hater is like going to Yankee Stadium as a Red Sox fan, which I've done. <laughs> Uh, so you're not going to own it, but if you're a doer, uh, stay standing, and if not, uh, take a seat. Um, great. So we have a lot of self-described doers. Um, so maybe we don't have a lot to teach you guys, but hopefully we'll be able to uh, share some insights from what we're doing. So just wanted to start, and uh, we're a little bit rushed, um, but really just starting to talk briefly about what we do. I said to Willie early that anyone who comes to SOCAP and doesn't know what Willie Foot does and what Root Capital is about, um, maybe you should do a little bit more research, but he's not as presumptuous as I am. So he insists on telling you a little bit about what he does at Root Capital. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about what I do at Nonprofit Finance Fund. Uh, and then we'll talk about what it takes to succeed and, most importantly, what it is we've learned from the doing since we were last year. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, speaking of haters, my mother, I mean, well, my wife hates the jacket I'm wearing now because it's fake leather. <laughs> Uh, but I've worn it virtually every single time I've been on stage or hung out with, uh, with Anthony. So that's why it's here. Thank you for indulging me. Um, super excited. But he excited. left his guitar at home. So those of you who know about that will be appreciated. Excited to be back at SOCAP. And what a wonderful theme, um, igniting vibrant communities. Just quickly kind of laying out what we do at Root Capital. So we're, we're an impact-first agricultural lender and uh, enterprise accelerator, if you will. Um, we... Um, the mission is to grow prosperity in rural areas, right, in poor, environmentally vulnerable places, and we do that by investing in agricultural businesses that build sustainable livelihoods for small-scale farmers who often lack, you know, the very basics, clean water, electricity, medicine. So specifically, we lend capital, we deliver financial training, and we strengthen market connections for small and growing agricultural businesses. So we're kind of, we're a social purpose ag lender, really the combination of a non-bank financial institution and an NGO uh, that we founded 15 years ago to address the missing middle of rural finance, right? Businesses that might aggregate uh, or serve hundreds or thousands of farmers, but they get stuck in that missing middle, too big for microfinance, too small, too risky, too remote uh, for the banks. And really, we start from the conviction that these agricultural businesses, whether they're a farmer association or a private entrepreneur that's working with smallholders, uh, through, say, outgrower schemes or a seed company or an agro-processor. They're an economic engine that drives prosperity in rural areas. Uh, and the challenge is they get stuck in the missing middle so they can't access capital or qualified employees or markets that they need to, um, to grow their operation or invest in infrastructure or merely pay the farmers on time, right? So they, they, they're missing out on good business opportunities and too often they fail to flourish. So We've grown pretty quickly in recent years, um, and a lot of uh, uh, challenges there. Uh, but this year, we're on track to lend $155 million to an active portfolio of nearly 300 businesses that um, reach roughly 500,000 farm households across 33 countries. And so including, for instance, $2.5 million that will go to four businesses representing 18,000 coffee farmers in the Congo, in the eastern DRC. And so, just maybe to wrap, regardless of how much we lend or where we lend, 
the larger vision is really to try to catalyze a smallholder agricultural finance industry that serves all 500,000, I'm sorry, 500 million small-scale farm households uh, in the world. And we'll do that by um, demonstrating business opportunities in the countryside with many others and crowding in competition. And this is a more recent thing and awkward but very powerful, working with our peer institutions, a.k.a. our competitors, to blueprint this nascent industry of, of smallholder agricultural finance and create the kind of standards and best practices that will underpin a thriving agricultural finance market that, uh, that is stable, that's sustainable, that's responsible, that's inclusive, um, hopefully that, you know, that, that ignites vibrant communities. Right. So what Willie's been doing for 15 years at Root Capital, which is really combining capital and expertise to unlock the potential of his clients, who are these cooperatives and other organizations that are enabling farmers to get the most value out of their work, is a real parallel for what we at the Nonprofit Finance Fund have been doing for 34 years here in the U.S., where our clients are nonprofit organizations. They are health clinics, homeless shelters, soup kitchens, charter schools, uh, performing arts centers, all of whom similarly are being hampered by their inability to access the right combination of the right kind of investment capital and the expertise that they need to run their organization as an effective business. And so we began in uh, 1980 in New York City, and you probably figured out that I'm young enough that I, uh, when I say this, it's a, with a bit of a wink, but I always say, you know, you remember in 19, the late 1970s that the oil price had spiked. Um, I don't, but I think some people in this room do. Not too many people, though, looking out. Um, but the oil price had spiked in 1970, and a lot of the old homeless shelters and settlement houses in New York City were built in the 20s and 30s by the first wave of philanthropy that had come to New York. And those were old, hulking buildings that were incredibly energy inefficient. In 1980, they came to their funder, the New York Community Trust, who had funded them for years, and said, our heating oil bills have gone up. We need a bigger grant to cover our increased costs because that's what nonprofits did. They covered their costs by going to foundations, getting grant money, going to governments, and getting contracts. The Nonprofit Finance Fund was born out of a very simple but powerful idea that rather than going and getting another grant from the foundation, what those organizations really needed was a loan to do two things. Put a new boiler in their basements that could be more energy efficient, and put new windows in the buildings that would trap their heat. And with that loan, they would be able to reduce the amount of heating oil they needed to the extent that they could repay the loan and end up with a better capitalized organization. That's a really simple idea. And now we call it green retrofit finance and everyone's excited about it. Back then it didn't have a name, but it was something we started doing. But it was also a really radical idea because the premise was that a nonprofit organization could access finance and think of itself as a business that had revenues and cash flows that could ultimately support a loan. And that's the idea we were born out of in 1980. Um, and since then, we haven't grown as quickly as Willie has, um, but we've done about $320 million worth of lending. We've made 700 loans, never lost a dollar of our investors' money, um, and last year lent across the country to a wide range of organizations, pursuing that basic understanding that as a nonprofit organization that's mission-oriented, you don't need to be excluded from the capital markets and from the opportunities that investment capital has. And on the other hand, as investors, are the people we borrow from, who we are paying back, have bought into the idea that they can make investments that support both the social purpose they care about as well as their financial return. So that's what we do. Um, and Willie and I, over the years, have had many conversations about the surprising parallels between our work, despite it being on the face quite different in terms of the kinds of clients we fund and specifically where we work. And so we just wanted to talk briefly about what have we learned from all this doing, about what it takes, and what does it take to make this work, and why can it be powerful? So, yeah, for us, um, success factors maybe. Uh, we could go into, I think, a whole host of success factors about our own shops that for us would be, for instance, embedding deeply in local talent and local markets and local culture, uh, being as close as possible to your clients, um, building deep industry expertise. But I want to share, I think, the most important point that's relevant for a SOCAP would be the following, that for us, success has been all about identifying the early stage agricultural businesses that have um, huge potential for impact, economic, social, environmental 
but that face a ton of challenges that if addressed, they become an engine of prosperity for countless uh, uh, rural um, kind of households. And the, the, the challenges are, are daunting. If you take Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, governments on average spend 5% of national budgets on agriculture, even though it's the primary economic activity of 70% of the population. So massive underinvestment in agriculture has left the continent uh, in Africa decades behind other developing regions. So as much as anything, our journey at Root Capital has been kind of a process of continual discovery and understanding of the constraints to business growth and success. And so it's not just at, say, the firm level, weak financial management, for instance, but weak sourcing channels from farmers dependent on NGOs for inputs and technical assistance, right? Poor infrastructure, um, you know, bad roads, unreliable electricity, crappy cold chain, the usual host of inhibitory laws and regulations and subsidies and taxes. So, in short, it's really tough to serve that lower segment, the lower end of the agricultural finance market. And I would say over the years, and this is probably the most relevant comment maybe I have to share today um, in terms of our, if not success factors, our experience, is that the um, critical thing has been not over-promising and not over-selling, that lots of good and lots of deep impact will happen without real risk and cost and even in some cases, significant subsidy. And we like to joke on our team that we're at the high risk, low return sweet spot of smallholder agricultural finance. And what we mean by that is that, you know, on the continuum of where mainstream markets meet clients' needs efficiently, on one side and on the other where economic realities dictate, um, you know, exclusive reliance on charity, we are squarely positioned in the capital preservation camp, like paying a small coupon um, combined with rigorous impact measurement, but also raising enterprise philanthropy to build a balance sheet and for capacity building and for industry facilitation. And always, always with a view toward reaching those earlier stage businesses and helping to unlock their growth and their impact in spite of all the challenges. And just one last point on this, and maybe this is a, like a call to action, but for, for those of you who aspire to reach those least served market segments, and I hope many of, of us do, um, consider what we call the cross-subsidy model, where in our case we are building the, a pipeline of early stage businesses for ourselves and for the larger industry, um, knowing that those early stage clients are going to be typically loss leaders at first. And then we accompany their growth, right, over time to the point where um, we achieve operational sustainability through a cross subsidy from the larger clients that are profitable to serve. And so we're not maximizing return necessarily at root capital, but what we are doing is helping to ensure that this agricultural finance market is inclusive in addition to being stable and sustainable and, and responsible. Yeah, I think it's really true, and I've heard Willie say this before, that knowing who you are and being clear about that is a really important success factor. And, and I joke that the impact investing is like a wedding. Those of you who've been at, at SoCap for a few years will know that we were earlier we were in this sort of weird phase after the ceremony when everyone's standing around, they're passing around hors d'oeuvres, but you don't know who's in the bride's party, you don't know who's in the groom's party, you're not sure who you should be talking to. And it's quite chaotic. And in that moment, everyone can sort of present to be something different to different people. So you talk to one person, you say, I can deliver you market rate returns. Then you talk to a foundation, you say, I'm all about impact. Now we're moving into the seated dinner phase where you get to look underneath your name tag and you see table one. And table one, you're sitting with Willie, and Willie's about, I'll preserve your capital, I'll deliver incredibly strong impact, and I'll do the really hard things. And that's where we are in the U.S. side. Over in table eight are people who are managing fiduciary money with the risk compliant pension funds who are doing something different. We need it all. And you wouldn't have a wedding party under that tent if you didn't have everyone. But I think <clears> being really clear and not trying to deal with that confusing period by trying to pitch yourself in too many ways to too many people has been very helpful for us in our work. We are absolutely in that same camp as Willie. We haven't lost our investors' money, and we can't because of who we borrow from. We borrow We've from the big banks. We've lost a little bit of our investors' money, just a little. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just a little. He has, he has better investors than I do, or more, more lenient. Um, but I think certainly for us, it's, you know, it's a similar story in the U.S. And we don't have, our clients don't have problems with roads, and they don't have problems with the power going off all the time that really hampers their ability to operate. 
but they do operate in a crazy system. It's a system where at the best of times, nonprofits are delivering 1% or 2% margins. Uh, we do a survey every year of the state of the nonprofit sector in the U.S., and we can tell you that half of all nonprofits have less than 90 days of cash on hand at any time. That's who we're lending to. In the good years, if they manage their contracts well, they're maybe making a slim margin. Those contracts are often getting upturned for very strange reasons. So I think so similar, we are finding that in our work, to be successful creates you can't just simply put the money out there and say, well, come to us people who want deals. Um, and it's not just about finding the deals, but it's what my team does is not take more risk, but work much harder and be much more creative to turn what a regular banker would look at as a completely unviable deal and work to make it happen. And subsidy is often a big part of that. Um, but there's no substitute we've also found, and this is, for me, transitioning from being a, a, a hyper of impact investing and understanding it theoretically to running an investment fund one of the biggest things I've learned is how important it is to get into what I call the black box of the client. Rather than just saying, if we create the investment fund and there's clearly a capital need, those two things will meet. They don't meet in a marketplace. They meet in the context of a very specific investment you make into a very specific for-profit or non-profit entity. And understanding how that entity works and the pressures that are on that team is the starting point for us to be successful in what we do. Um, so I see we're running out of time, and I wanted to make sure that we got to what I think is the most exciting thing to be here talking about, and that is what are we actually learning from doing? So what I asked Willie to think about, and I'll offer my thoughts, is since we were last at SOCAP, and were you here last year? No. So he has two years. years, I have one year. Um, what do we now know about this work that we did not know, in his case two years ago, in my case one year ago, because of the doing we've been doing over the last year? So what are the few things you've learned since last time you were here, Willie? Okay, so I have a tendency to overshare. So I'm going to overshare a little bit. Um, I think what I have learned, what we have learned as an organization, is how much trouble you can get into. If you don't have clear expectations up front with your investors and your donors about one really key thing, which is that you can't decode everything up front in the face of market failure, that we have to dive into this work, but with our supporters... We need to have room and license to adapt and iterate. And if you don't set that expectation very clearly up front, you can, you, there can be serious misalignment. So our, just our quick story. Um, we hit serious headwinds in 2013 as an organization. First time ever we didn't grow, largely managing kind of macro forces that were um, beyond our control, um, but that can threaten even the best laid strategies. So for instance, uh, market externalities, collapse of the coffee price in 2013, coffee leaf rust disease, a biblical scourge that many of you will have read about um, that's hitting the Americas with a vengeance tied to climate change. Um, the rising competition from other social lenders, God bless them, moving into our space, a great thing for market creation. Uh, meanwhile, we had recently undertaken a large multi-year pre-raise of capital for a, a debt and grant funding for a five-year strategic plan, which was pretty successful, the pre-raise. But we didn't hit our targets last year um, in terms of volume, credit volume, in terms of revenue, in terms of risk. Not radically off, but we didn't hit our targets um, as a result of managing these headwinds. And um, some got spooked. And, uh, and, and pulled out, even as others kind of deepened their engagement. But in the end, our kind of successful pre-raise kind of unraveled. So here's what we did quickly um, right. This is what we did just because I, I don't want my communications person is glowering at me right now. What we did right last year was we very aggressively communicated and shared our learnings throughout uh, the headwinds with our investors and our donors and our board and everyone else. We, um, we implemented lean cost controls, but being very careful not to undermine our productive capability in the field, where most of our team are local Africans and Latin Americans spread across eight regional offices. Um, we focused on voice of customer business initiatives to manage the situation, and I think actually got um, better, much better at um, serving our clients. And then this year, the market, certainly in coffee, uh, the market rebounded. Uh, and um, albeit with a lot higher volatility in, in the commodity markets in general that we need to manage. And we were there ready and standing by to resume growth kind of together, together with our clients. So two key learnings, and I'll wrap. 
First one, I mentioned it. Again, you cannot decode everything up front, and you really need to have, kind of like in Silicon Valley as a tech company, you need to have the license and the room uh, to iterate and to adapt to changing circumstances. We should have done a better uh, job of setting those expectations up front, and we certainly intend to do that going forward. Um, second key learning, and this is kind of picking up on some of the themes that Anthony just mentioned, and I'll close here. We appreciate now that impact investing is much more specialized with a lot more segments uh, within it than even just a few years ago. So you've got government agencies and corporates and foundations and religious pension funds and high net worth individuals and family offices and so on and so forth. And with that comes many different theories of change. <laughs> Right? Everybody has their own theory of change. And so you have to, and that's not a problem, but you have to be very careful about aligning your theory of change. Even if it's artfully adaptive, but not bleeding into chameleon-like, your theory of change with the theory of change of your, of, your, of your investors. And so, for instance, finding alignment around, in our case, financial, what's your philosophy behind financial performance? Right? In our case, operating self-sufficiency, or OSS, or break-even, is a very key driver of internal operational efficiency. Right? And it's an important indicator for achieving a demonstration effect. But it's not the most important one. It's not the only one. And you have to weigh it against mission trade-offs in terms of maximizing financial return versus, as I mentioned earlier, creating a very inclusive market as a catalyst kind of pipeline builder for our industry. Another one is, in our case, we are absolutely in the school of a multi-pronged strategy to achieve impact at scale. And, and so it's inextricably linked. Finance, advise, catalyze, lend capital, build local capacity through financial management training so folks can better compete in global or local markets and then catalyze an industry, thought leadership, field building, impact measurement, and so on. All three together are the three legs of the stool. My father, by the way, said to me once, please don't call it a strategic stool. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, but those three together, <laughs> uh, do you have alignment? Or people like, I don't care about the advice stuff. I don't care about the catalyze stuff. They're, they're inextricably linked. And lastly... Within the factory gates, what's your direct service delivery? What about outside your factory gates? Like, what do you do through partnerships? How do you engage at the landscape level? How do you leverage the ecosystem? All these things in the face of what is a multidimensional, very complex thing called poverty. So what I can promise is this year, um, come back, coming back next year, we will have learned a lot more, and we will unapologetically continue to adapt and to iterate uh, into next year. That's great, and I would recommend, I think, Willie and his team are a gold standard in communication, and it's all on his website, rootcapital.org. Um, really great quarterly reporting, and are able to convey both the metrics as well as the stories of what they do. I'll just talk about what we've learned in the last year. Um, I think we've come here, and you're going to hear in a minute about a big policy initiative that some of us have been a part of. One of my biggest learnings is the role of government in impact investing. And last year when I was here, I said, don't ignore the role of government, because government creates the conditions under which we can operate. I've really come to appreciate even more, it's not just that government creates the conditions, but if you are going to do impact investing, especially in a developed market, where you are trying to assess or address issues of real poverty and social inequality and justice, ultimately you are going to be investing in organizations that rely on government funding to pay you back. That's a huge insight that I've had. My team probably had it 20 years ago. But a real understanding, it's not just that we need government to create the conditions of which we as private investors can make a difference. Almost all the work we do, at some point down the chain, we are getting repaid because government is helping to fund a service. It's true in the U.S., it's even more true in Europe um, and in the developed parts of Asia. So if you are operating in developed markets, let's give you three quick examples. Uh, we've helped finance a 200-bed homeless shelter on 25th Street in Manhattan, a $20 million project. We were able to lend $2 million into it. We are paid back because the city of New York and the state of New York are committed to funding those services. We are ultimately financing government through the financing of a nonprofit. Um, just south of here in Los Angeles, we've been financing an amazing charter school that sends a huge percentage of kids, not just to college, but gets them to graduate from college out of a high school they've set up. They needed money from us to rehab a building and start their new school. Ultimately, I'm gonna get repaid when the state of California provides that charter school with the revenues they need to do the education and pay us back. We see this in sector after sector. There's a health clinic in rural Hawaii serving a population that previously had no access to primary health care in their community. We were able to make that loan, help that facility get started. Ultimately, it's government, Medicare, and Medicaid payments that are going to make that happen. So government and the role of government. You cannot be an impact investor and make a difference on real issues of deep poverty and social justice and inequality in a developed market if you do not get really smart 
about understanding and supporting the flows of government into your, bar, into your borrowers. The second thing we've learned, and again, I think the investors in this room with more experience than me would say this is a no-brainer, uh, it's about the management team. When I'm trying to get it, I just, we got a three and a half million dollar loan approved through our committees, and the loan is going to enable an amazing nonprofit to take a state contract um, and massively expand this delivery of health care into a certain population in the state they operate. To make that happen, they have to go from a 700 person team to a 1400 person team, and that's what they needed the loan for. They needed upfront money to put in the IT systems, the recruiting practices, and get that engine going. Ultimately, I only got that loan through my committees because we were able to convince the committee that we absolutely believed in the management team of this organization. If you are not backing management teams, then you're backing real estate collateral, and you can do some great things, but ultimately, to do amazing work as an investor, you have to understand the management teams. And the last thing I'll say, and we've been told to wrap, is my biggest learning last year, and I think Willie certainly knows this is true, um, this is hard, and this is why I think the the hypers out there are constantly looking for information that affirms their hypothesis that this is easy and inevitable. Uh, and the haters out there look at any kind of hiccup and say, see, we were right, this is impossible, you can't do it. Um, the main thing I've learned is that this is just really hard to do. And there's lots of ways, Elizabeth Littlefield was mentioned earlier at OPIC. Um, she has a great line. She says, you know, there are a lot easier ways for me to make money. I do what I do. <laughs> at the simplest level, what we do, we do because we aren't the kinds of people who are trying to do the easy thing. Um, that's easy to say, and it's hard, a lot harder to live with. You know, I think Willie talked about root capital doing cost alignment. I mean, that's a euphemism for an absolutely traumatic and emotional thing that goes through an organization that is trying to do something hard. Um, and it's not about, you know, you feel like you have a failure of leadership, but what we do is really hard. Um, and I just learned, again, that's why just going back to you know, accept that this is hard. And what Willie said earlier, we are not going to learn by sitting and talking we're going to learn by doing, and doing with a humility that comes from knowing that what we do is hard, um, and what we do is supremely worth it. Um, so I'm just really excited to uh, be able to share these thoughts, and it's always great to be on stage with Willie, and very much look forward to hopefully being able to work with many of you in the, in the coming years as you take on this journey and, and grow with us. So thank you. Thank you.